this is, a, to my mind, one of the great suppressed stories of modern history. Uh, in August of 1619, a retreating Habsburg army camped in Ulm in southern Germany for a few days. They had were retreating from a campaign against Prague where they had successfully deposed the winter king and queen. And in this group of troops, of several thousand troops, was a young French adventurer, 22-year-old soldier of fortune. And uh, that night, in August, the night of August the 12th in Ulm, he slept and had a dream. <clears throat> and an angel appeared to this young man and said, the mastery of nature is achieved through measure and number. This was René Descartes. This was the founder of what is called materialism, rationalism. His marching orders were given to him in the same way that Mohammed got his marching orders. All of modern science is the was created at the behest of an angelic entity. Well, they're not talking about this at Caltech and MIT, let me tell you. So how many times in history have uh, voices taken the wheel? This encounter with these small, alive sentences, which are coming, approaching you and showing you stuff, telling you stuff. It seems to me as a rationalist that if you're having a conversation with someone, there must be rules in communication theory. Someone must understand this. You know, in artificial intelligence, they have this rule that what is artificial intelligence? Well, if it's a black box and you can't tell whether there's a machine or a person in there, it's an artificial intelligence. Uh, you might set up a similar test with the alien in the head. I've tried to figure out how can I tell that it's not me? How can I create a logically tight trap for it so that I can absolutely tell that um, it isn't me? And I haven't been able to figure out how to do that. This learning stuff from entities is not respectable in our present official intellectual world. But when you start asking questions, you'd be amazed where entities have acted and with what force. Uh, another example, one that's dear to my heart, is, because uh, I kind of identify with it, is Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a poor surveyor from Devon, who was out uh, uh, collecting insects in Indonesia in the last century, and he got a fever on the island of Ternate, malaria. And in the midst of this fever, he understood the solution to the great problem of 19th century biology, which was called the problem of the species. He saw how random mutation and natural selective forces could produce biological diversity. And when he came down from this thing, and this was again an angelic deliverance in the height of this fever, he, uh, he couldn't figure out what to do with it. So he wrote a letter to the greatest scientist of the age, which was Charles Darwin in London. And when, Lo and when Darwin opened this letter, you know, he just said, holy shit. This guy has scooped me. Twenty years I've been working on the origins. Here it is in four paragraphs. Who is this guy? Well, so then it became the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution for its first 50 years. And then Wallace dropped out of the picture because he disgraced himself by an interest in spiritualism. But uh, you can understand why uh, if the guy got the original vision from an angel. Can I come in on spiritualism? Sure. Mackenzie King, who was Prime Minister of Canada for about 40 years, all through the war, it was always kept secret that he was totally a spiritualist. And even if you read history since the war, when he died, suddenly everyone discovered this. And then there's been a terrific clamp on it again. 
But I know Canada is a small country, but the Prime Minister of a country very involved in decisions of war was getting most of his stuff from spiritualism. That's right. This is part of what I was talking about last night with the time wave. The alchemical dreams of the 16th century, of the Philosopher's Stone and all that, never really died. Instead, the triumph of secular secularism and so-called modern science, post-Newtonian science, pushed the the dream somewhat into the background. But after um, James Clerk Maxwell and Helmholtz and those people discovered the electromagnetic fields in the 1870s, uh, I mean, we are totally intellectually at home with the idea of electromagnetic radiation. We don't see what an occult thing it must have seemed to the 19th century, where they had just risen to the place where they conceived everything mechanically, hard objects whizzing through space, force, angular momentum, conservation of energy. Well, then comes Helmholtz and Clerk Maxwell and these people, and they say, oh no, there's a diffuse invisible vibratory medium that extends throughout all space and just you know complete occult uh, kind of vocabulary well that has now because it could be formalized through uh, the uh, uh, Maxwell's equations for magnetic radiation somehow the occult side of it dropped away for us that's how you take the magic out of something is you stride to the blackboard and write a tensor equation of the third degree and then somehow you have it so these fields became very mundane and could be used for radio and television and so forth it took someone like Marshall McLuhan to point out that the Christian program for the entry of God into history reaches uh, the uh, period of the intercession of the Holy Ghost once Marconi throws the switch. That the electrical web of noetic information, the instantaneous transformations of the global logos, this is the age of the Holy Spirit. And... uh, You know, it's a funny thing how effects in nature can be drawn forward and concentrated. For thousands and thousands of years, electricity was understood to be that thing that you see when you take a uh, cat skin into a darkened room with an amber rod and rub it rub the cat fur with the amber rod and then as you stroke it in the darkness you see static electrical discharge through the cat fur and this was known since Hellenistic times it was a magic show demonstration but it took the concrescence of novelty the descent of the Holy Ghost into history to draw the crackle out of the cat fur and set it as an envelope around the planet transducing the information that knits together the dominant species well how many things lie about us present at hand uh, ready to be uh, somehow reconfigured in some uh, salutary or salvific uh, way. One of the things, one of the insights that I had from all the fiddling with shamanism in the Amazon was that everything can be simple. If things aren't simple, we haven't thought about it long enough. Mm -hmm. That's why I like that population idea yesterday because there may be a yet simpler idea than that but that really gives me hope because if you don't have a simple idea you can be pretty sure you don't have the solution the solution is going to have to be pretty simple and straightforward because it's going to have to be executed by the combined uh, commitment of millions and millions of people Basin with Gregory Basin started a lot of like Russell had a slightly different version of evolution than Darwin did. 
how Wallace did. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, it's an it was an interesting intellectual episode, and it actually has something to do with what we're talking about because there have been many descriptions of what the controversy between Wallace and Darwin really was, what it came down to. And I don't think most modern people realize this about evolution in the 19th century. These guys, like Darwin and Thomas Henry Huxley and Charles Lyell, they were uh, waging war against Christianity. They were the great warriors of atheism. And the way it worked, the way atheism was waged intellectually in the 19th century was it took the form of a denial of purpose. This is called in theological language teleology. Purpose is telos. And a huge amount of the intellectual energy of science in the 19th century was put toward showing that there is no purpose, no end state that... See, many people think of it, when they think of evolution, they think of higher and higher ascents towards some kind of ideal. No biologist, biologists curl their lip at this interpretation. A biologist believes that you have random mutation, random, colliding with selective pressures in the environment, and out of that you get a best fit, and that best fit is maintained and passed forward in time. But it was absolutely anathema to the 19th century scientists to suppose that there could be, you must never speak of purpose, you must never speak of goal, you must never speak of an arrow toward an end point. They said, no, no, it's much more a, a random walk. You know, in Hamlet where he says, uh, it's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's precisely the position of 19th century biology on what biology is about. Well, the problem there is it, that theory of evolution works very well when you're looking at the uh, evolution of species. Evolution of one ladybug, you know, the plain orange ladybug into the lady, the conspecific nearby species with black spots. This all works very well. But what it doesn't explain is the emergence of the phyla, the great forces that pulled forward the phyla. The other thing it doesn't explain are phenomena like metamorphosis, for instance, in insects. If in evolution proceeds out of uh, random mutation working against natural selection, well then a process like metamorphosis where thousands of genes have to be coordinated perfectly with one another to take a worm and transform it into a winged flying creature with a sexual potential. I mean thousands of genes are coordinated to do this. Well, how can you imagine any random evolutionary event that would give you a halfway point in metamorphosis? It's either all or nothing. So Wallace, looking at the same data that Darwin was looking at, uh, said there must be a telos in nature. And in that sense, he is the founder of the revolution in science that I tried to carry forward last night with the time wave. Because this was entirely a theory of telos, of, of being drawn toward an omega point. Well, recently, Dar I mean, Wallace and my ideas have gotten good support from uh, these frontier areas of mathematics called uh, <coughs> chaos theory and dynamical systems theory, because they deal in a quite rigorous fashion and with no excitement or arm waving with these things called attractors. And attractors are actually um, basins in the energy topology of a process <coughs> such that all things in their vicinity are drawn to them. 
just as if you imagine you had a flat floor, but then there was a, a steep dip in it somewhere. Well, when you swept this floor, you would discover all the dirt in the bottom of the dip because that's the minimum energy state for the system. I think that history is uh, the, the great um, test for all of this new mathematics and holistic thinking and generalized metaphor making. It's one thing to predict the course of a stock market or the uh, fluctuation of an ecosystem, but if our mathematical models are good for anything, then they should be good for modeling the matrix in which we find ourselves. So that what we looked at last night was just like our entry into the soapbox derby of historical modeling, which is now going on at quite a furious rate because uh, planning is very, very important. I mean, we have to make some very important moves in the next 30 years. The wrong move will checkmate us. I mean, this is a heart-in-your-throat kind of situation. We need to study the board very carefully. You know, just one more wrong move, and uh, there could be a cascade of some sort in one of the many critically poised uh, domains that threaten us that we would not then be able to reverse. You think we can make a wrong move? Oh, I think we could definitely make mm -hmm. a wrong move. It's easy to imagine wrong moves. I mean, here's a wrong move. Use white phosphorus bombs to torch the oil sands in Saudi Arabia so that you get a nuclear winter without a nuclear war. That would be a wrong move. Uh, you know, cease to resist the spread of infectious disease. Uh, nuclear proliferation. Now, so far, we've shown a remarkable ability to locate and make wrong moves. Uh, the banking system, uh, the role between men and women, the stuff we were talking about yesterday, how much resources should be committed to space, how much to feeding the starving, how much... Uh, it's an energy problem. We actually have a finite amount of energy and we are in a box and we need to calculate, you know, how many paths are there out of the box? How much do they cost? How long do they take? And who eats it in each deal? Because it's very hard to find a way out where somebody doesn't eat it. I mean, uh, that's why I was so fascinated that the mushroom could offer a, a, a instantaneously offer what seemed to be a fairly humane, non-coercive, non-invasive, and extremely cogent and bare knuckles uh, suggestion as to how we might solve our problems. I mean, you could commission three UN studies and not get that much plain talk. Yeah. Um. For those who want to uh, explore the mushroom experience, do you have any insight or guidelines for them, uh, books to read, uh, how to communicate? How to communicate. Books to read. Well, I always recommend, because it's easy to get and, and very good, dense information, that book called Hallucinogens and Shamanism, edited by Michael Harner from Oxford University Press. And then, you know, there's a plethora of, of publishing. I, I, it's so natural to me that I almost forget to say it, but uh, uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, your first stop has got to be the library, you know. You have to educate yourself because this is the most lied about area of human relations. I mean, it's out there with transsexuality and stuff like that. I mean, it's an extremely misrepresented, misunderstood, hated, feared, loathed, and to an attacked place. So you have to learn the players and the positions and how to read this pharmaceutical literature. The real data is in journals. 
I mean, there are scientific guilds and brotherhoods where all this information moves around fairly freely. In fact, Esalen over the years has played host many times to the high priests, uh, the chemists, and the and the psychotherapists, and uh, people like that who are making it happen. So, but it's all in journals. Very little of it gets behind hard cover. In terms of recent m publishing that you might find interesting anyway, there was a festrif published for Gordon Wasson called The Sacred Mushroom Seeker that has a bunch of interesting articles in it and a strange article by me that does not discuss the Welt of Africa either. Yeah. Did you say on the first day that you, you weren't taking mushrooms anymore that the conditions in the world were such now that we couldn't pay you to take five dry grams? Well, I meant fairly temporarily. My, requ my requirement is, I mean, because even when I get all kinds of weird stuff, I mean, I get spread out. I mean, I see aircraft I can't identify taking off from airfields in thornbush country, and I can't even tell the war I'm looking at, you know? Is this South Africa? Is it Zimbabwe? Is it Libya? Where are we? What's going on? Uh, that's in the early stage, the swimming through it, you know. Do you think that that actually, do you think it's because of your knowledge about what, about current events and the fact that you know this stuff is going on, or do you think that whatever the turmoil is, the mushroom knows about, or it exists independently of you? No, neither of those. I think that uh, what the the way to think of these psychedelics is uh, they amplify the morphogenetic field. And so it's not because I follow current events. It's not because the mushroom knows that. It's because it's all around us in the air. It's like all the FM and short wave and long VHF, UHF, all this information. It's as though suddenly you're transparent to it and you actually feel the planetary body heaving, you know, and now there's a huge volume of information moving in Arabic and Pashtun and all that, and you just, you know, it's real. It is not a hallucination. You are entering, this is the unconscious of the human species, hardwired. It begins behind your eyes, and when you let down into it, you know, it's like uh, Gibson cyberspace, except that you don't need the fancy board and all that. That's just to give permission to realize that this is happening. No, it's a penetration of the collectivity. I mean, you can really feel it. It's really there. It's the aura of the human and biological envelope of the planet. And I don't know how deeply you can read it I mean, obviously, like the time wave is, for me, it's a kind of blueprint of the thing I see in hyperspace. It's a, it's a CAD CAM sketch of the, of the philosopher's stone or of the transcendental object. That's the kind of shadow it throws. But it's the whole collectivity. You know that, I can't remember who wrote this poem, I think nobody very interesting, it's kind of dismissed as doggerel, but do you know that poem, I saw eternity the other night, a golden ring? Well, the wave is eternity as a golden wave, it's that all time is a standing wave in eternity. Plato said this, he said, time is the moving image of eternity means that eternity is some kind of higher dimensional object and the present is like a, a wave moving through this, moving around the donut of eternity. And the, the time wave then shows the fine structure in this donut. If you could assimilate this idea and expand it and connect its vocabulary to the vocabulary of the perennial philosophy, I think you would see that they're saying the same thing. They're saying, you know, uh, everything already exists in some higher dimension, yet there is free will within certain constraints, and uh, somehow the, t the task of the of, uh, I don't know, self-growth or spiritual understanding is to get a perspective on this. 
get an image, to become all space and all time. That's what those guys and gals sitting there for 40 years in Zazen must be looking at. They have become everything, not in some metaphoric or pissant way, but they have become everything. And, that's, uh, and they've done it through an act of identification with the internal image of the totality. I mean, this sounds to me awfully, almost, it's too airy-fairy, but it's because we don't have a control language for it. But it's a, it's a real thing. We must learn to be able to command the image of the totality rather than think in terms of telepathy or something like that. I've had experiences like in the Amazon taking mushrooms and, uh, well, basically taking mushrooms where it would seem that I could see at all times, almost out of the corner of my eye, I could see the whole planet like a, like a whole earth decal. I, I was just always aware of it. I, I could see it in the upper right-hand corner of my vision. If I just glanced up, it would be there. Well. You know, to have it not as an image, but as a hypercard button into the thing, uh, then all reality becomes, you know, the stack you're moving through. And, uh, and boundaries dissolve. That's the thing. I mean, your boundaries are going to dissolve. You just might as well come to terms with that because they're going to plant you. So uh, why not experiment with it ahead of time so, so that you have some, some, uh, something that you can do with it, you know? And when you dissolve your boundary into the living world, then, you know, you become everybody. A la Humphrey, Humphrey Chimptonier Wicker, the hero of Finnegan's Wake. Here comes everybody, you know? You look here and he's Chaucer. You look there and he's Churchill. You just can't tell who this is. Somebody, yes. Um, when you think of the year 2012, do you envision a range of how you can live as we've never lived before? I don't know the, the details. I can't quite yet see clearly how it's going to work. But I think that we are preparing our own new world and it's a new world in the imagination. The imagination is, a, is real estate. You know, this thing that my mother taught me, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. That's the program of psychedelic crypto-anarchy. We want wishes to be horses. The beggars shall ride. And that's why I gave a certain amount of energy to virtual reality. I'm trying to figure out where is this doorway into this other place because there is another place. I mean, that's what DMT teaches you incontrovertibly. I guess that's the real shocker, hush my mouth and blow me away. There's another, there's, some, there's a parallel world, not light years and centuries away, but right here <laughs> uh, and it's not you know the pentagon isn't investigating it you're investigating it and uh, uh, sure and this parallel world when you break into this elf infested space there is such love such affection for humanity that you know it moves you to tears I mean why do these alien things care so much. Who are they? What are they? I mean, one of the ideas that I've been pushed toward recently, and uh, I don't know why it took me so long to get around to this, but my therapist could probably tell you. Uh, if you were to go to uh, shamans in the Amazon or the hills of New Guinea or somewhere and, and say, describe the DMT thing and ask, what, what's going on here? What's this about? Without hesitation, I think, most shamans, most shamans would just say, oh, well, uh, th those are the ancestors. So that's the bit with us shamans. We, we contact the ancestors and then we cure and find lost objects. And so, well, this is 
uh, in all the po in all the psychedelic voyaging I did, I never really entertained the possibility that with all this boundary dissolving we were going to do, that we were going to actually flirt with dissolving the boundary between life and death itself. Is it possible that there is some kind of ecology of souls over yonder? Is it possible that the 100,000-year-old claim of shamans that they can pass from here to there and back again is so? This, I mean, we feel so weird about death that we don't know how exactly to look at this. But if we are conservative in our hunt for the source of the alien voice, and the steering mechanism of history. If we're conservative in our search for the source of that, we shouldn't reach to the conclusion that uh, Galactarians from, uh, uh, you know, Zanebel Ganubi are in charge of things. It's far more likely that, you know, our dead ancestors are in charge of things. After all, after us, they are the only human thing we know. There's nothing else. And uh, the, so then when I go in there, I carry this thought with me. Am I in the bardo? You know, is this the way station to the lesser lights? Uh, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The, and sometimes I think that what happens at the very center of the DMT flash, the thing that is so mind-boggling that no one has ever retained a memory of it that they could discuss with the gang, is uh, you confront your soul. You somehow meet the double, a la Carlos Castaneda, God forbid. But you actually come up against a being which as you interact with this being, it dawns on you who it is, and it's you. And then, you know, there's some kind of an apotheosis, an apocatastasis, an outbreak of Greek of some sort for sure. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this reality obliterating flash that I'm describing as the sine qua non of psychedelic voyaging, I have a real question in my mind as to whether or not the shamans in the Amazon uh, encounter it very often because it's very hard to concentrate the DMT sufficiently to deliver that much to the synaptic cleft all at once. The brilliant strategy they've worked out is the slow-release oral DMT in the ayahuasca mix. If you make ayahuasca stiff, you can, after an hour and a half of pranayama and breath control and like that, you can work yourself into a place where you say, you know, my God, this does look like a DMT flash. I mean, it's happening more slowly, and you've had more time to get used to it because it's taken you a while to get there. But you can approach that thing. The thing is, uh, people are universally the same, I found. And even among shamans, there's a lot of, number one, bluff and fear. And it's very rare that you meet a real exploring soul who is not afraid of it at ultra high doses. So a lot of the shamanism in Peru is vitiated by the need to cure and make money and have a position in the community. And, uh, and also the style in Peru is not to demand vision. Most, you meet a lot of people in Peru who have taken ayahuasca who don't have the faintest idea of what is possible. And if you should have occasion to show them or to be involved in seeing them encounter it, then they say, you know, I had no idea. It's a very subtle um, kind of thing. And uh, the snuffs, then, are the other DMT um, approach. And for me, the snuffs are so complicated, there's a lot of problems with the snuff. I think it's an overrated thing. 
Number one, there's the physical problem of taking it. You have a bamboo tube about this long, and you load it up with a tablespoon and a half of ground, woody, toasted seed material. Well, then you sit, and your friend sits in front of you. You put the tube up your nostril, and your friend blows as hard as he can. You don't do it because you would restrain yourself too much and it wouldn't work. It has to be somebody else. It's like pulling a tooth out. Somebody else has to do it. So he blasts this up your nostrils. You know, it's like being hit in the face with a two by four. I mean, you you scream, you fall over backwards, you salivate, you squirm around in the dirt a little bit, and then you sit back up and by this time he has reloaded for the other nostril. <laughs> and then, you know, you go through the whole thing again. Well, then after, and then it comes on, and it is tryptamine-like, and it is, you know, the vision clarifies, and the energy rises, and you're loaded, really loaded. But uh, when you uh, do a chemical analysis on the varola resin, the resin of these Amiristocaceous trees that are the source of this, uh, it's not a clean source of DMT. There's a lot of junk in there, too. There's not only DMT and 5-MeO-DMT, but there's also alpha-methyltryptamine, monomethyltryptamine, uh, and, and numer uh, some beta-carbolines, and this is not what you want in a drug a source drug plant. You want a clean signature. That's why Socotria viridis is so preferred in the ayahuasca brew because there's nothing in it but NN dimethyltryptamine. It's, a, it's very clean. So those are the sources. And then nowhere else in the world did these tryptamine cults arise. We have no evidence of it ever existing except out through the Caribbean islands and down as far south as the Atacama Desert in Chile. But the, the DMT, the tryptamine complex, is entirely new world. Yeah. The, the parallel world that you come to see exists, that you access through DMT, is there also a parallel world like that that you can access through the mushroom? Uh, is the same world? Well, not exactly. You see, the mushroom behaves like you expect a drug to behave. You take it. You sit around for a while. You feel a little funny in the stomach. Your nose runs. You go to the bathroom. And then you have this experience. DMT isn't like that. DMT is you're in a room. People are talking to you about some... They're pushing some drug on you. And there's this little glass pipe. And then you do it. And at that point, the building blows up. <laughs> and... And, uh, you know, I've seen people come out of the DMT flash and what they say is, what happened? What happened? And they don't even know, they, did we do it or did the building blow up? <laughs> did, is that, you know, because it's not like a drug. It's like an experience. It happens to you. It falls upon you. It's like an automobile accident. <laughs> it, it, it has this, and I think that that has to do with the instantaneous transition. It happens so quickly that you say, this is not a drug, this is a place. The other thing about DMT that I think is really interesting is if you don't panic or if you're not a nervous or anxious type and you can be fairly objective, it doesn't do anything to your body. It doesn't do anything. It, it affects only the visual cortex, I think. I mean, there may be spillover, but it's incredibly selective. It's like surgical bombing, you know. It's just coming in on this one thing and hitting it so hard that you can't believe it. I mean, you reach through your body and you say, and the other thing is, it doesn't affect your mind so that you don't have illusions that you are now enlightened or you now understand something or you are... It, 
it's you stay the same your body is the same your mind is the same what has happened is that the world has just been replaced all this it's all gone 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 and gone and there's not even three-dimensional space left and you're just looking out into this stuff saying hmm, uh, you know and and um, <clears throat> It's very. It's a great shock to the intellectually constipated, and I think I led the list. And it, it was just so shocking to me. I can't imagine anything more shocking. I mean, if flying saucers were to land on the south lawn of the White House, it's page two news compared to compared to this, and. Uh, I feel very fortunate. I mean, I somehow started out, it's, it was the quest for the weird that brought me so far. I was always a strange kid, and I was always into what people weren't into. So I missed out on a lot because everybody was into it. But I also got into a lot of weird stuff. And my, my method is edge running. That's what I do. I had a friend, I had many weird friends who were very good for me and gave me great advice along the way. And one of those people never read a book unless it was 200 years old. And said, you know, you must be kidding. It's all vulgar after 1830. So, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in those places. Well, apparently, if you pursue the weird, it won't take you very long before you get to this. This is the main vein of the peculiar. I always talk about, and I might as well again, what the hell, that short story by Jorge Luis Borges in Labyrinths called The Sect of the Phoenix. Do you know that story? It's a page and a half long, and it talks about how there is this sect and it's always existed as far as anybody can tell. And these sectarians have been persecuted in every pogrom in history. And these sectarians have prosecuted every pogrom in history. They are not associated with any race, any place, any religion. They are associated with an act. And the act is trivial. It involves something orange. It can be done in doorways. One child may initiate another. At first, the adept find it ridiculous and never speak of it. They refer to it among themselves as the secret. And he goes on and on talking about this thing. He's talking about this. It's true. Now, I was not initiated. So I've taken no oath in blood to say nothing. I found out I'm an, a, a debunker, an exposer, and I've never met a sectarian. Everybody I, uh, who knows anything about DMT, I told them, except for the one person who told me. And, you know, this is a society where people jump out of airplanes for thrills. Uh, it's a thrill-crazed society, and DMT is not a problem in this society. Nobody wants it. It's too much, you know? It's as though there was a design process that went beyond the expectation of its engineers. I mean, you know, you go Chevrolet, Mercedes, Porsche, Maserati, Lamborghini, and then they say, please, no more, we can't stand it. Well, that's what this is. It's, it's beyond <laughs> expectation. So, uh, you know, we don't need stronger drugs. I never hope to have anything stronger than that. I mean, I think it carries you right to the threshold of the lesser lights. You see... Uh, you know, to go further than that is to snap the umbilicus that binds us to the biological matrix. Do you experience any continuity in your connection with, in the mushroom and in DMT with these intelligent entities like from one trip to the next? And has anybody else met the same friends you've met? On mushrooms, a lot of people report elves and stuff like that. The thing that happens to me on DMT that is so specific 
that elves offering the singing language making objects and all that uh, it's hard to get people to report and I don't know some people seem to have the same thing people talk about a converging set of motifs the motifs there seem to be two ways to approach DMT one is uh, as the carnival the archetype of the carnival because one thing about DMT is it's furiously active it's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon run at double speed I mean there's just all this zany stuff this Marx Brothers kind of humor going on and this is a thing about these elf creatures they're into a kind of humor that is right on the edge of terrifying it's sort of like hanging out with hell's angels except they're your friends you know so as long as you keep everything cool it's gonna be all right uh, they're rough and tumble and uh, uh, like the archetype of the circus the central point of interest is the three rings and the clowns and the performing animals and the lady in the spangled costume but then away from the main action it gets weird it's sideshows it's kinky hoochie coochie dancers dark shadows pickpockets who knows what's going on out there and it has the same idea it's like an elf carnival it's a troop it's a cosmic troop and then the other thing is it's Christmas morning you know that that amazing childlike approach to the tree lit with lights and this expectation of gifts and all that in, in fact it's interesting uh, if you want to look at a folk way that seems to have not been fully explicated uh, take a look for a minute at Santa Claus Santa Claus is uh, the master of the elves and Santa Claus's elves make toys and Santa Claus is associated with the colors red and white the colors of Amanita muscaria and Santa Claus is associated with reindeer and reindeer are part of the Amanita muscaria cult because you can drink the urine of the reindeer and it's better than the first get-go of the mushroom and then if all that weren't enough Santa Claus uh, lives at the center of the world he lives at the North Pole where Yggdrasil the magic world tree uh, is growing and then he is active at the winter solstice with his elf giving gift giving elves so this is clearly a very old folkway that has all the motifs of DMT uh, embedded in it and it's the major area where we give permission for the expression of these images in our own culture I mean this is where we get uh, all of this stuff and the magic toys of Santa's workshop are the demon artifacts of the elfin forges uh, that are alchemical productions yeah it really is a Santa Claus hey <laughs> there is a Santa Claus it puzzle my belief in elves is very puzzling to my children <laughs> Yeah. We've never had mushrooms before. What we'd like to is there a uh, sort of good housekeeping seal you can get on? All right. If you run into it, is it likely to be clean, or are there things to watch out for? How does the best advice I can give you, and it's not what you want to hear, but uh, is you should grow it because growing it is an act of alchemical dedication, and it will if you're not able to take the mushroom because of personality flaws growing it will eliminate those flaws because growing it teaches you uh, attention to detail cleanliness punctuality discretion all of these fine virtues which then uh, are, will serve you very well when you take it and when you grow your own then it's really alchemy you know I mean this the white stuff is the seed and you take rye a la Robert Flood you take rye and you inoculate it with this white stuff and then lo and behold over a period of days and with the 
a helping hand of nature spirits why your friend comes to meet you. I, I, I don't know if it's a neophyte, a neospore, or a neophyte. How do you tell if you got? I mean, you can you can get the, that source for the growing of mushrooms. That's oh, you mean the spore? Yeah, How do you the get the spore? And the instruction. Well, fortunately, I wrote a book on this subject, <laughs> <laughs> which um, I think it's in that catalog. And if you buy the book, in the back of the book is an ad for spores. So it's all there, no problem. It's on the shelf called Addictions of all places. <laughs> addictions. Is this where they put it now in the stores? <laughs> Oh, well, yes, we published under the names Otios and Oeniric. That's because I'm Otios and my brother is Oeniric. But, uh, yeah. Terrence, uh, to return to the Velf for a moment, mm -hmm. is, what other theories are there that even come close, come close to explaining <laughs> The, be the, the straight theory, the new straight theory, which is in a book by William Calvin, the name of which escapes me, but in, anyway, uh, is that um, it was the coordination of the throwing arm that we were small and weak and we were predating upon these humongous beasts, mastodons and like that. And so we learn to throw things with incredible accuracy. No animal can throw like a human being can. So Calvin's theory is that in triangulating, triangulating and coordinating the throwing arm, those cells began to replicate that were necessary for coordinating that complex data. And that set the cascade going. And that's the best theory. It seems to me it's very weak. There's no good ideas on human emergence. It's the speed of it, you see, that is so incredible. There are many interesting things about human beings when you contrast us to the uh, other primates. You've probably heard discussions of how different sexuality is uh, in human beings as opposed to other primates. That, for instance, there is in human females the suppressed estrus so that it's not possible by looking to tell whether a female is fertile or not and it's not seasonally confined. And yet those qualities of primate sexuality uh, completely set it apart. Uh, the hard wiring for language, but then more also important and not very well understood is the role of neoteny in human evolution. Do you all know what neoteny is? Neoteny is the preservation of juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And this often happens with animals. And for instance, if you were to look, compare the ratio of our head size to body size compared to the ratio of a chimpanzee's head to its body size, you would see that we are very fetal in our proportions. Even in adulthood, we retain many, many fetal characteristics. Our hairlessness is a fetal characteristic. The prolongation of adolescence uh, in human beings is a neonatal trait. All this juvenilization seems to have occurred simultaneously with the expansion of the brain size. Well, to my mind, this supports the theory that I put to you because all this, uh, all this juvenilization is probably being caused by the same thing which I'm suggesting caused the expansion of brain size, i.e. exotic tertiary metabolites in food. And, and so we actually bear upon ourselves the stamp of an accelerated period of mutation that's gone on in the last million years. That's why we are, we are actually really freaky. I mean, you can sense this, I think, about us, that we're, uh, you line up all the monkeys, and my God, the one on the end, the pink one, what's that about? And, and you know, they've done, um, they've done gene sequencing studies of the pygmy chimpanzee, which is apparently the closest living relative 
to human beings. Well, 95% of the genome of the pygmy chimpanzee is identical to the human genome. Well, that means that the 5% that is different is almost entirely taken up in the expression of superficial physical differences. Our height, our hairlessness, our head to body ratio, and all that. So I really think, you know, we're the creatures of an omnivorous diet. Our story really is a you are what you eat uh, story. And you're talking about the, the brief span of time, even pushing that. That's right. Harder, That's right. As opposed to, say, uh, uh, whales, which I know is not your favorite topic, uh, who, had, who had a much longer time with large brain size. Yes, I mean, they evolved very leisurely and in an aqueous environment where the conquest of fire was not even a possibility. And uh, all, it has to do not with brain size so much as with your um, appendages into the world. I mean, you have to be able to f chip stone. You have to be able to throw things. Otherwise, your intelligence will be very zen-like. And there may be such intelligence. I mean, I don't say that the dolphins and the whales don't think thoughts that we can't even conceive of and that are very satisfying to them and fully uh, expressive of their program of being. But they can't, they can't communicate about it. They can't build an image of it. They can't leave any record of it. So it's interfacing with matter is equally as important as... Uh, as the quality of the thoughts behind the eyes, you know. Just another whole doorway that's so ignored and belittled is every night, the, you know, the launching pad when you hit the pillow. And um, Dreams. as a culture, I mean, that's meant the helpers that come. Um, I wonder what the relationship between that and the plants. But it's, 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 it's huge and boundary dissolving and, and real. And just, fall asleep about it. Yes, I agree. If, if, if lucid dreaming were, can be made to function for everybody, if it's actually real, then probably we can get rid of psychedelics. Uh, well, this is, a, this is a good place to mention a really interesting thing. I tell most of my groups this because someday I'm going, uh, some young researcher will hear me and follow this up. But here's an interesting piece of data. If you have smoked DMT at some point in your life, it's possible to have a dream in which the theme of DMT will be introduced and you will smoke it and it will actually completely happen. That is an important piece of evidence because what it shows is the chemical um, material is there, the mechanism is there. How, I mean, that's exciting. Imagine if you could just go into a brainwave pattern or something and begin to call it in and it doesn't seem so far away if it's happening in the dream they've done human sleep studies and they know that uh, endogenous production of DMT in the brain peaks between around 4 a.m. in most people well this correlates well with the peak REM activity, it means probably that DMT is driving dreaming in some fairly profound way. Uh, dissolving the boundary between waking and sleeping is a classical shamanic technique for entry into the invisible world, either by sleep deprivation or some other way. So yeah, this is a very good point. Uh, uh, the, the world of sleep and the psychedelic world, the question is why are we constructed so that we can't remember? It's so frustrating. I mean, this is our main problem, is the mnemonic problem, both with the drugs and the dreams. Why do we go to worlds of incredible richness and complexity which we cannot remember anything about? It seems a strange statement on the economy of nature, uh, if there is an economy of nature.
I was amazed at the state of dream theory. I hadn't paid much attention. About two months ago, there was an article in Scientific American on dreaming. It was the most reductionist. It, it was, they've, they've gone back a hundred years. I mean, basically, they're saying it's mostly undigested pieces of potato. Uh, <clears throat> it was an incredibly, I mean, they threw out all Freudian, all Jungian, all interpretive. Uh, the, 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 what's in vogue now is that it's junk data. Uh, it's the dumping ground, you know, meaningless. Any effort to understand dreams is like going through somebody else is wastebasket. It doesn't make any sense at all. So more denial of the power of, uh, of the unconscious. Orthodox science more and more is simply talking to itself because the bodies of experiences that people are building up in their own lives do not map onto the scientific model. I mean, most people have a very largely irrational component operating in their lives. I mean, we can identify it in each other uh, because we sort of share the same control language. But what about all those people out there in the, in the trailer courts of America who, you know, put your hand on the radio? I mean, this is not a scientific paradigm in action. Uh, this is pure voodoo. Uh, <clears throat> I, it was William James who said, uh, if we don't read the books with which we line our apartments, we are no better than our cats and dogs. <laughs> you don't need to have the experience every day of a miracle or something extraordinary to know that it's real. Well, the, the place where the miraculous is, uh, is most evident is uh, in falling in love. Falling in love is a really interesting phenomenon. I mean, you, you can be the guy who marks the tires in the parking lot of the great corporation, and one day you see the daughter of the first, second, and fourth vice president go by, and you fall in love with her. And now watch what happens. Mountains are moved, coincidences occur, appointments canceled, deaths if necessary, in order to bring you together. And then you get married and are unhappily spend the rest of your life with this woman. <laughs> but in the, in the process of getting together, almost everybody experiences magic. It's almost as though the universal zeitgeist, what it's really interested in is gene matching. It's really interested in who gets horizontal with who with consequence because that's obviously how it steers and sculpts the historical animal. It understands that the pigments of this oil painting are genes and that the landscape is being painted with a genetic, in a genetic medium. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Opium. Well, the, uh, the civilization that built itself around opium was the late Minoan civilization. I mean, when they first did the translation, when Michael Ventris first translated Linear B, the tallies that they were translating, they thought this symbol was for wheat because the tallies were so huge. Then they realized that with tallies for gum opium, it's a complicated question because the products of opium are fairly unsavory and virulent, although they do have their defenders. I, my analysis of opium and the way I've used it in my life was to uh, escape pain of one sort or another. Uh, the opium reverie is not as interesting as the hashish reverie because it's harder to retain. The way I look at late Minoan civilization is it was in great mourning for the passing of the goddess because Minoan Crete was the last bastion of the old, old goddess religion that had come out of Africa at the time of Chatalhyayuk 
but it all died in Asia Minor in the 5th millennium. But it survived in Minoan Crete up until 1000 BC. When, so for three millennia, Minoan civilization drifted in an anhistorical dream. And slowly over time, the uh, accentuation of opium uh, use increased. It's interesting, uh, you know, opium, you, you say this and people's eyes widen, isn't this a drug of degradation and addiction? Opium has been around for thousands and thousands of years. It wasn't until 1624 that the, Amer that the English physician John Playfair noticed for the first time, so far as we can tell, that it was an addictive substance. Before 1624, no one knew opium was addicting. There is one mention in Dioscorides, but other than that, so the virulence of opium addiction is tremendously overrated. In fact, it's, it's silly to talk about it that way, unless you're using it as an instrument of national policy. It's funny, you know, we have drug wars. A hundred years ago, a little more than a hundred years ago, they had a drug war in the Far East. It was called the Opium War. What was the Opium War about? The British government's wish to sell opium on the in the ports of China against the objections of the Chinese emperor. The Chinese emperor didn't want opium in China, and the British, whose tea trade had undergone a collapse, had shifted their agricultural production to opium and they were unloading it on the Chinese population while they tried to figure out what to do with all these tea ships. So in a hundred years we've gone from a war to force people to buy opium to, you know, the present state of manic schizophrenic <coughs> attitudes about it. Yeah. Pain cultures. This is very possible. Pain is, is a very subjective thing and, and uh, I imagine much of antiquity was fairly unpleasant and, uh, and opium would be there and it would certainly be there if you developed tumors, untreatable ulcers, any painful chronic condition, opium would be your obvious recourse. Addiction as a general concept, it's probably in John Playfair. They began purifying and, and using alcohol extractions. You know, opium is... Uh, it's interesting how these intoxicants, I mean, uh, both opium and alcohol were made popular by alchemists who thought they had discovered the elixir of life. Uh, when uh, Raimondus Lully discovered distilled alcohol, he got so jacked up behind it that he announced the end of the world. He, he said, you know, hey, this stuff is so good. <laughs> And uh, opium was popularized by Paracelsus. In fact, Paracelsus invented uh, uh, chemical medicine. If you want to look for a kind of a bad guy, or a, at least a black hat figure, it was Paracelsus who said we shouldn't use herbs, we should use purified extractions, we should make pills, uh, we should get rid of all this midwifery and all this nonsense and put medicine on a scientific basis. Of course, he was also a mad alchemist and, uh, and, uh, and popularized opium. In fact, von Helmut, uh, a student of his, was uh, so into popularizing opium that he signed his alchemical treatises, uh, Dr. Opiatus. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 11.30. Um, yeah, last um, shot. Um, with uh, ayahuasca, can someone take that alone, or is it best to have sort of a, uh, a guide? Well, this issue of the guide, it's a good place to end. Uh, it depends on the kind of personality you are. I mean, I, I have always taken things alone because other people are such complicated creatures, and I can't ever relax completely in the presence of another person and so they kind of hold me on the surface but there certainly have been trips when I would have loved to have somebody to hug uh, if it doesn't bother you to be around people or you don't feel that as a kind of impediment then there should be a sitter 
and always starting out or in uncertain situations there should be a sitter but the sitter should be very non-invasive and my style of psychedelic tripping is calm dark comfortable not no music no music because I want to see what it is in a situation of sensory deprivation which is where it's most beautiful the best music is in silence the best pictures is in darkness always I go in yeah it's possible to take psychedelics and entirely miss the point because you are so extroverted and so nervous and agitated I mean uh, Roland Fisher who did all this experimental work with psilocybin gave it to 25,000 people published all these important papers and he and I were talking one day and I said well but Roland aside from all this data and all this uh, you know, what do you make of the hallucination? Just the source of them, the complexity of them. He said, I never closed my eyes. I never closed my eyes. I mean, is this denial or what? <laughs> I, I, I could hardly believe my ears, you know? I mean, the, the psychedelic experience is not, it shouldn't be projected. You don't take it and then look for a good movie or go out to catch ACDC or it's just silent darkness and let this stuff come out of the organism and you will be amazed I mean this is your birthright your real inner riches and it's uh, it's more than you expect more than you imagine more than you suppose more than you can suppose I mean it's the it's the center axis of what it is to be a minded reflecting human being I mean, we can go through life without knowing this but is the game to go through life without knowing about as much as possible that sounds like a fairly ass backward approach to things I think you know we want to assimilate life we want to explore it we want to find the path to the next level I mean I can't believe that I, I sort of believe the Catholic idea that there's an obligation to do something and to behave correctly but it has nothing to do with attending mass on Sunday and keeping your language clean it has to do I think with an act of intellectual heroism of some sort uh, 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 a way of positioning yourself vis-a-vis -vis the experience of the world that then can lift you to higher and higher levels and that's what these things were put here for and if we use them I still have hope 